Good morning. Uh, today I'm reading from Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through 40. Give everyone a moment to get there. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. He leased it to tenant farmers and went away. When the time came to harvest fruit, he sent his servants to the farmers to collect his fruit. The farmers took his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first group, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenant farmers saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those farmers? Thank you, Hen. We might look there if you are in a if you have a Schofield Bible, we're on page 1029, I'll just mention that. It's a parable of the tenant farmers. This is a story the Lord Jesus told. And as Haddon has read it for us, we'll come back around to it here in just a minute. But let's just go to the Lord in prayer one more time just to help us understand what is here and then how we might apply it to our lives. That's the main thing. How do we apply it? So, Father, we give you thanks for the time we might uh, now focus upon your word and to glean from it the things you'd have us to see. Help us to see it in context, but help us to see the application of it for us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is kind of an interesting story. It's the kind of story that kind of gets your hackles up a little bit. It makes you feel like that's not right and and and. You know, there, there's, there's things we hear, right? Sometimes we hear a story in the news, and we'll hear about how uh, some particular people have been oppressed, or we hear how someone has been done wrong, or we'll, and, and, and by everybody's estimation, that's, that was wrong that that happened. And, and we feel a certain bit of righteous rage sometimes about those things. If, that should, if I was there, I, I'd have tried to set those things right. Well, this is a story being told by the Lord Jesus. It's called a parable. Uh, and that's, uh, that's not, doesn't mean anything in particular of, of, of significance except that it's a story that has a, a greater meaning than the story we hear. Um, the Lord Jesus told a lot of these. Uh, he was trying to convey heavenly truths with an earthly story, and so it is here. Now, if you have done your Sunday school over the years or have had times to hear, you've heard the parable of the sower. A sower went forth to sow seed, and some fell on good ground, some fell on bad ground. Or maybe you've heard uh, some other parable that the Lord Jesus told. And a lot of the parables that he told his disciples would come around later and say, what did that mean? Because they didn't get it either. I mean, they're trying to understand, but that seemed like a, a kind of a strange way to preach to the masses. Well, here's one that the audience, they get a hold of pretty quick. They understand. But we want to understand it for us a little bit. And so let's look at it a little more closely. We're going to take it through just a few steps, and then we'll come back to this question that the Lord Jesus asked. That's another thing. I don't, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of another parable where he tells a parable and then asks a question at the end of it. And so we're going to see what, what is that all about, and I hope, I hope it'll be of interest to you. As far as context and timeline, you see we're up in Matthew chapter 22. There's only 
only about 26, 27 chapters in Matthew. So we're getting close to the time when the Lord Jesus is going to be betrayed and when he's going to be crucified, when he's going to be wrongfully put to death, an innocent man, uh, but rejected by uh, his own people and accused of, of being an a insurrectionist, some of that going around, and, um, and therefore put to death. And it's the greatest crime of all history. It's coming soon. Before he tell, uh, But he tells this story first. And the people that are around him as he's telling this, well, there's his disciples. They're there. You know, those are the 12 men that followed him, walked with him, were with him for like three, three and a half years and had, had heard his ministry, had heard his, his instruction. They've been trying to glean what they can from him. They have confessed him as the Son of God who he was and is and will always be. They know that he is something special, and there's never been one like him. And I promise you there never will be one like him. He is the unique, the only begotten Son of God. He is God the Son, in fact. He's God manifest to us because God took on human flesh and walked the earth, and that's the Lord Jesus. He's listened to by his disciples. He's listened to by this, the public that's around. And there are religious rulers that are there. These are the leaders of the people. Now, in our society... Um, we have elected officials that we consider our leaders or our representatives. Foolishly, we, we think of them as our representatives when, in fact, they want to be our lords. That's just part and parcel to it. And we, we fall into that. We say, well, they're our leaders. They're, they're the ones that govern our society. But that's, those are elected in our society. In the Jewish uh, economy, it was the religious leaders that had the authority to dictate and, and drove public opinion and what happened. And so they're gathered too. And they're there listening to him. And they are looking. They are listening. They want something. They want him to say something that they can catch him on because they want to kill him. And, and we would read that in the chapters up leading up to this. Can you imagine... What if it is you? You had to think about every word you say. Man, I would fail. I would fail. Um, maybe you would too. But the Lord Jesus is there. And they're listening to see what he has to say. And so he says, well, I'm going to tell you a story. And here's how it goes. There was a certain householder, a landowner. The word... Uh, from the Greek, means basically a house lord. He was a master of, of a home and lands, okay? And he planted a vineyard, it tells us. And he hedged it uh, as, as hadn't read, he fenced it. And then he, he, he put a wine press in it, uh, which required some effort. And he built a watchtower there and then he let it out he leased it to some to maintain it for him to operate the farm for him while he went to a far country verse 34 of Matthew 21 says when the time of fruit drew near he sent his servants he sent servants back to check on his vineyard What's going on? How's it coming? We should have fruit now. Let's, let's, let's see what we've got. Let's enjoy the fruit that should be presented. And it says in verse 35 that those, those gardeners, those, those tenant farmers, uh, King James calls them the husbandmen. We still today speak of farming as husbandry. Well, that's what they are, he took those servants, and instead of saying, yeah, 
here's what we've harvested. Here's what we've got so far. Here's an accounting of, of what has been sent to the, to the produce market. Here's, here's what we've stored for the winter and for the year to come. Here's, they, they, it says no. They took his servants and beat one and killed one and stoned another one. Well, I presume maybe one of those made it back to report. And so the landowner does an incredibly interesting thing uh, to me. I mean, very patient, very long-suffering. It's like he thinks, well, maybe they didn't understand. So he sends more. He sends more servants. More than the first, it says in verse 36. He said they treated them the same way. They treated them the same way. Bless you. Last of all, verse 37, he says, they're not getting it. They're not understanding what these servants are coming for. I'll send my son. I'm going to send my son. They will reverence my son. They will respect my son. Sons often are the epitome of the father, right? There's, there's that that stands out, even for those sometimes who maybe don't favor as much. Nevertheless, they have characteristics, they have mannerisms, they have, they have speech patterns, they have things that say, oh, you're so-and-so's boy. I know who you are. I could tell. People say Ben uh, is looks very much like me. I, I don't know that. I, I, I wonder about that, but many people, they, can't, they, they spot one in a picture and they realize that wasn't me, that was, that was Ben. Um, I think the increasing ball spot on the back of his head probably helps with that parallel. Um, and so it is, fathers and sons. And this, this father says, I'm going to send my son. And that will make the difference. They'll respect him. They will reverence him. Verse 38 tells us they saw him. And they knew who he was. They didn't mistake him for another servant. They didn't say, oh, I wonder who this is. No, it says, when the husbandman saw the son, or the tenant farmers, or whatever your translation might say, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him. And then we'll seize the inheritance. It'll be ours. And they caught him, and they cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. Verse 39 says, and then the Lord Jesus asked that question we were talking about. When the Lord of the vineyard returns, well, what's he going to do about it? Makes me angry just reading it. Yeah? I mean, it makes me angry. Makes you too. We see what the character of those gardeners is. They've been entrusted, right? But they're not worthy. Not only do they take the, the, those first servants that come and treat them disrespectfully, that would be a mild, mildly putting it, they treat them shamefully. And then, as we've said, the landowner says, well, they'll respect my son. But when we see what happens, we say, well, he was wrong about that. He missed that one by a country mile. They didn't give any honor or reverence to the son at all. This final deed is the most horrific. It's, it's the most calloused. It would seem that the householder the landowners 
prediction was totally wrong. And the Lord Jesus asked the question. So, somebody asks you a question, especially a question of a story like this, it's pretty easy to answer. Look, if you would, at verse 41. They say unto him, well, he will miserably destroy those wicked men, and he will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen or to other tenant farmers, which will render him the fruits in their seasons. He said they will be annihilated. Because these religious rulers, they're thinking, that's what I'd do. Sometimes you and I think that, right? We hear of a, a great crime, we're thinking, this is what I'd do. That fellow needs some high-speed lead therapy. That's what I'd do. We think that. Sometimes. The Lord Jesus laid out this story for men who are the guilty parties, and they pronounce their own judgment. You might remember in the Old Testament, Israel had a king named David, and David was a, he was a great king. In fact, God said of David's lineage, I'll always have a king. David was the one who slew the giant, right? With the, with the stone and the sling. David was the one who, who outstripped all of Saul's commanders where it became a hit song that was known. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. Why do I say that? Well, they sang it in Jerusalem. And when David went over to the Philistines, he found out they sang it over there because they all knew it over there. There are three times it's mentioned in the Old Testament. Oh, yeah, Saul's killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. But David committed a great sin. He took another man's wife. And to cover up his sin, he, it, the man was one of his commanders, one of his military leaders. He put him in the hot of the battle where he would be killed. And then David took the woman as his wife. A prophet came to David, a prophet by the name of Nathan, as a matter of fact. And that prophet said... David, I want to tell you a little story. Yeah, go ahead. And he tells him a story about a man who had raised a little ewe lamb who had, it, that it was like more than a pet almost. It slept in his bosom. It was just this dear, precious little lamb to this man in Nathan's parable. And there was a rich man, it says, and he had a visitor come, and he wouldn't take of his own flock he took the man's, the poor man's little ewe lamb and dressed it and served it for his visitor, the rich man did. Well, and David heard that story. It was just like this story. He was like, that, that man needs to be put to death who would do that. He should, he should pay four times over for that. Nathan uh, looked at the king and said, Thou art the man. You're the one. You're the rich man that took another man's little ewe lamb. You had a visitor come by. His name was your fleshly lust. And you succumbed to that craving and satisfied your lust with another man's wife. You're the man. David pronounced his own judgment. David had four children either die or be 
or be um, uh, disgraced. Well, that was that was his judgment as king that should happen to the man that did that, and lo, it did happen. The Lord Jesus, in presenting this parable, is presented to the ones who would pass judgment on themselves. Let's look just a minute, a little further on. The Lord Jesus says in verse 42, Did you never read the scripture? Which they're the religious rulers. Yes, they've read the scripture. The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. That's exactly what they said should happen, right? That it should be taken, the vineyard should be taken from the, from the wicked gardeners and given to another, another set of tenant farmers that would present the fruit. The Lord Jesus said, that's exactly, you're exactly right. That's what's going to happen. And whosoever, he goes back to thinking about the stone, verse 44, whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. So there we have it. The Lord Jesus says, here's the householder. It's God. God's a householder. And he brought to their minds things that we might not think of immediately, but the Jewish mind did think of immediately. Because way back in Isaiah chapter 5, Isaiah in the Old Testament, chapter 5. You needn't turn there, but you certainly might want to look at it later. God talks about Israel as his vineyard and how he plants a vineyard. And so when the Lord Jesus starts telling this, these guys are thinking back in their mind, Isaiah. And in and, and reading of this, Everything that the Lord Jesus says has significance, right? I mean, there's never a word that he spoke that was wasted air. That's incredible because I might have been guilty of wasting a little air sometimes. I tremble at the thought that the Bible says we'll give an account for every word. Ah, there's a few words I've spoken I'd rather not give an account for. But the Lord Jesus, grace poured into his lips, the scripture tells us. He never said a word that was wasted or untrue. Bear that in mind. So when he describes what the householder did, it's not just flourishes to the story. He's telling something very important. So let's look at it just a minute back again in verse 33. We know who the householder is. It's God. We know who the vineyard is. That's Israel. God planted a vineyard. You know, he took these people. They, he, he went with this man Abraham and says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. Yeah, there were nations all around. There were, there were tribal peoples and great groups of peoples all around. But he says, I'm going to take you and your children and you're going to be a great nation. And through you, all the nations of the world are going to be blessed. And this would be through the Jewish people. All the nations of the world were going to be blessed. So God planted a vineyard. That, the idea, if I have a garden, that's my garden. I set it apart, right? I took a part of my yard and I made it a garden. Okay. 
That's mine. And it says he puts a hedge around it or he puts a fence around it. It means it's, it's separated, right? It's, it's a, a fence, obviously, is there maybe to keep animals out or people out or to keep things in or whatever, but he's segmenting it off where it has this, this level of separation. And the Jewish people were separated from the rest of the peoples in the world. They were the only people, first of all, that had the one true God as their God. All the nations around them had all sorts of deities and all sorts of things that they worshipped and bowed down to. And we read about it all through the Old Testament. The Bible's not shy about saying it. These people uh, worship Molech. These people worship Chemosh. These people worship Dagon. These people did this. These people did that. The Bible tells us all through the Old Testament. It also shows us who is the one true God. God set them apart. He separated them. He said, by the way, I have some things I want you to do. And there's, there's particular uh, dietary laws. There's particular instructions that uh, you do this at this time and you do this at that time. There's, there's a whole list of things that separated them, that made them distinct, made them different from the nations around them. Besides just the fact of having the one true God as their God. And then it says the landowner, he dug and created a wine press. It's a wine press. Well, what's a wine press? Well, we're not Old Testament people or even... New Testament in that sense to know exactly how that worked. But you can imagine... With what little you know, that this would be a place oh, where we're going to take the grapes. We're going to bring the fruit of the land and we're going to make wine. Now, what's the purpose of making wine? To preserve it. It not only was a, a, a drink to enjoy, that makes glad the heart of man, the psalmist would say, but it's a preservative in a day of non refrigeration. You this would be a way to keep it. And the other products that would come out, of vin vinegar, for example, or other things that would be used for a preservative. So, so this wine press, this that makes glad the heart of man, well, the results, the benefit of that, there'd be a portion of it that'd be a benefit to the tenant farmers. You know, they, they deserve some of the benefit of, of their labor. And then, of course, the landowner looks to the benefit of the labor, right? I want to suggest to you that this wine press speaks of the worship that God directed to his people, Israel. The, the things that he guided them, even in worship, while God got the glory the people got benefit from it too. The people got benefit from it too. Even in some of the sacrifices. The, you brought a sacrifice, you got a portion of it. It would come back to you, particularly in the peace offering. The wine press would tell us of the worship God had laid out for Israel. And finally, we read that there's a tower. He erected a tower hadn't read it as a watchtower. I will suggest to you that a tower speaks of prote protection, a place to go for safety. And we see that throughout the Psalms and throughout the Old Testament, you know, where, where the people would go, go to a place of safety. Laura and I went down a few years ago to Fort Mims. Now, if you don't know where Fort Mims is, that's okay. 99% of the people in Alabama probably don't. Just weirdos that like history, like myself and my daughter, would know where it was. But at Fort Mims was a place where there was an Indian attack in 1814 in Alabama. And the Indians came in and slew 
several hundred men, women, and children. And it prompted Andrew Jackson to come down a little later. No, excuse me, it was in 1813. In 1814, Andrew Jackson comes in, defeats the Red Sticks at Horseshoe Bend, and then he takes a little trip back to Tennessee, turns around, goes south, and defeats the British, who were using the Indians at the Battle of New Orleans. And you know the song. 1814, we took a little trip. We went down the mighty Mississippi. January 8th, 1815, the British Army, the greatest army, greatest naval force in the world, was defeated at New Orleans. Fort Mims. Fort Mims had walls around it. Unfortunately, they didn't think enough to close the door. And so the Indians, who, with whom some of they traded, I mean, it would not have been unusual. They had a little bit of warning that things were not good, but they had a building there to lock up in. And, and, it's, and there's a replica of it stands today there at the site. That gave some protection for some amount of time. Well, the watch, the tower that is in the vineyard is there for protection. And God would protect his people. And over and over and over again, in the stories we read in the Old Testament, God preserved his people. Okay. So there's no, there's no wasted words there. We have some things for us to think about. God's separation of his people, his, the worship he has for his people, the protection he gives his people. Now the servants that came in the story are his prophets throughout the Old Testament. And the record is just like it says. They killed them. They didn't want to hear God's word. Even, even some of them, they told them, shut up. We don't want to hear it anymore. We don't want to hear what God has to say. People like that today, right? God has a word for you today. And you can either hear it or you can reject it. You can say, shut up. I don't want to hear it. Listen, the Lord Jesus is the most polite person you'll ever meet. If he presents you the opportunity to receive him and have eternal life and live with him forever, and you say, no, I don't want it, he says, oh, I really want you to come. No, I don't want it. Okay. Okay, you have the choice. The servants were rejected. But God, who is incredibly long-suffering, maybe he's been long-suffering with you. What does long-suffering mean? You know what it means. It means you've suffered with it a long time. God suffered, has suffered with some of us a long time. He's waiting. He's waiting. And, and he's been rebuffed and rebuffed and rebuffed. He sent his servants to talk to you about your soul. And you said, no, I don't want to hear it. No, I don't want to hear it. He's been long-suffering. But one day, that will end. And it's like one of the hymn writers wrote years ago. If, if God's calls to us have, have wearied me, what happens the day that that it wearies him. He's tired of calling. The prophets came and were rejected, and so comes the son. But the landowner in the Lord Jesus story says this very interesting statement in verse 37. They will reverence my son. You say, well, that is not what it looked like. It happened. No, they will reverence the son now they caught him it says they took hold of him you might remember in the garden of Gethsemane they came and bound the hands of the man who spoke to them and caused them all to fall to the ground just with his word they caught him that was in the betrayal and it says they cast him out they didn't even want him in the vineyard. They threw him out of it. 
John would write in his first, or in his gospel, he came into his own and his own received him not. He was cast out of his own inheritance. And then they killed him. They thought, this is it. We're done with him. I can't imagine the perverse joy that have been in the hearts of these religious rulers when they coerced the Roman government to crucify the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus says at the end of these verses we read, the stone which the builders rejected, that's him. The same is become the head of the corner. What does that mean? If you've looked at an old castle or uh, perhaps a stone-faced wall with a doorway, you may see stones go up to the top, and then there's a stone right in the middle. That's called a keystone, right? That's the one that's keeping everything else together. There's that thought, and then there's the thought of a foundation stone. Maybe even this is more significant. The stone that the builders rejected, we don't want that in, in our construction, in our building. God said, that's exactly the stone I want that's going to be what the rest of the foundation and everything else is built on. And in fact, in the New Testament, we read that's exactly what's happened. The foundation of our faith is based on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the stone that has become the head of the corner. He will have his rightful place in spite of his enemies. In the letter to the Philippians, the Apostle Paul writes that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Now you're going to say that, well, I don't know about that. Yeah, I know there's a bunch of Christians in the world today, but there's lots and lots of Muslims, there's lots of Buddhists, there's lots of people that are animist or have other belief systems or whatnot. Surely, I mean, yes, there's a percentage of people that follow Christendom, but no, no, no. That's not what's being said. It's being said for everyone, whether they're following one of the isms of today or whether two millennia ago they followed Chemosh and Molech and Dagon, all are going to bow the knee and say Jesus is Lord. That's the work of God. God has said, they will reverence my son. Well, Scott, that's all very interesting. Um, but that's talking about Jesus and the Jewish rulers and those people. I mean, what does that apply? What does that got to do with me? Well, I will suggest to you there are some striking parallels for the church of God today, for those who are followers of the Lord Jesus and for those who should be and we would desire would be followers of the Lord Jesus, for those who know the Lord Jesus as Savior who have recognized their need before a holy God and said, Lord, I can't do it myself. I must have you as my Savior, I claim the promise of John 3.16 that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. God, I believe in your Son. I take him as my Savior. For those who know him as Savior, we too are separated. The Bible tells us the Holy Spirit of God comes to indwell the person that is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit does not dwell in the hearts of all men. He only comes in to dwell within those who have trusted the Lord Jesus as Savior. And at that moment when they do so, 
It doesn't come gradually. It doesn't come over time. It's not, it's not, I have to go do something to get more of the Holy Spirit. No, the Spirit of God, when life comes, it comes with the, the earnest of our inheritance. It comes with this proof that we have an inheritance in heaven. It's the Spirit of God dwelling in us. It separates us from the rest of the world. We're a separate people. We're not another, we're not a nation, a physical nation like Israel. We're a, a nation of called out of every tribe and every people and every nation. Racism is a great sin for a believer to participate in because the Bible tells us it'll be one, there'll be some out of every tribe and every tongue and every people and every nation that makes up this body that's the church. This, this group in heaven that sings the praise of the lamb that was slain, say, you redeemed us by your blood and made us kings and priests to our God. They're people from all around the world. Why? Because God so loved the world. When the Lord Jesus met the woman at the well, you remember the woman at the well? She was a Samaritan. The Jews weren't to have anything to do with Samaritans. But the Lord Jesus sent the disciples into town to go get lunch because they were hungry and they couldn't wait, and he just waited because he had meat that they didn't know about. Well, what was that? It was to do the will of his father. And so he sat there by a well in the middle of the day, and here comes a woman of not a good reputation that comes out to the well in the middle of the day. Very strange thing, because normally that would be done in the evening. But if you're kind of ostracized from your local society because you're not a woman of very good reputation, you might have to go out in the middle of the day when other people aren't around. And then she gets there and, who is this sitting at the well? And she meets the Lord Jesus. And she meets him. And he says, you know, if you knew who it was that was talking to you, you'd ask him for living water and he'd give it to you. Really? I'd be interested in that. He says, go call your husband. Well, I don't have a husband. He said, yeah, I know. You've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. She says, I think you're a prophet. Is that all I had to say? Did you pick up on that? Okay. He tells her, all that she was, and he tells her how she can have life. I'm telling you today how you can have life. How you can have life. And it's extended to every man and every woman and every boy and every girl. And that life is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. She went back to town. She says, come meet a man who told me everything I ever did. Isn't this the Messiah? And they came, and they met him. And they say, now, this is really interesting. Now, they said, now, not just because of her testimony, but now that we've met you, we know you're the Savior of the world. First time that appears in Scripture, in the, in the Gospels. And John repeats it in his first epistle. The Savior of the world. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We're separated by the indwelling spirit that is the ours to keep us. We have a worship. We have a relationship that's unknown by the world because we're in a relationship with the Son. And through the Son, the Father. And we can bring our praise and our adoration, a sacrifice of our lips, and so on and so forth. And we have his protection. We have his life. And the scripture tells us that no one can take it from us if you know the Lord Jesus as Savior. No one can take it from you. And in fact, 
the Lord Jesus himself says no one can pluck you out of his hand. So I got you. I got you. If you're mine, you're mine. You're not going to squirm out. No one's going to snatch you out. It's You're in my hand and my Father's hand. It's like their hands are like this, linked together. We are absolutely secure in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, is there to be fruit? Absolutely. It's to God's glory and our benefit. As we walk with the Savior, as we are obedient to his word, as we seek to live our lives to honor him, we're producing fruit for him, right? There's fruit produced in our life, benefit to us, fruit that he receives the glory of. And, and that is what brings delight to his heart. And when we neglect that, well, then we become unfruitful. And that's dishonoring to God and our Savior. We have a great privilege. That's to represent the Lord Jesus until he comes. And in that time, let's be seed sowers and fruit bearers. May the Lord just add his blessing to his word. Father, we give you thanks for the time to look into it, to think on this particular parable that challenges our thoughts. Father, it seemed like the religious rulers were just running along, keeping all the rules, uh, living relatively uh, uh, honest lives, and yet... Father, in fact, they were, had fully rejected you and they recognized your son and said, we don't want him. We don't want him. Father, we come this morning, we pray, I pray, Father, that there wouldn't be a soul here that would say they don't want him. I pray that they would, that, that everyone would say, I, I want him or I need him and would take him as their very own. Father, you know our hearts, and I pray your spirit would work in them according to your will. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.